I'll, I'll give you a brief update since I, I gave a talk a half a year ago. So this is the um, attempt to understand uh, which kinetic plasma physics is important uh, in the secretion flows and how this can affect dynamic observables. Um, just as a teaser, I'm, I'm showing this um, uh, large uh, GRMHD simulation that our team led by um, Bart, uh, Matthew, and Kushik um, run on Summit. Uh, this is, I think, the largest uh, magne magnetically arrested simulation ever. This shows um, large events of eruption of the magnetic flux from the black hole horizon. They're accompanied by formation of large scale current sheets. And we think these are important uh, things to understand because they can power both the multi wavelength flares and affect the uh, dynamics of uh, accretion on long time scales. Uh, Bart going to talk more about this in his talk uh, in a half an hour. Uh, so uh, what of this can be affected by um, effects of collisionless plasma physics? Um, so the first effect that uh, people realized long before is that if you're accreting or ejecting some flux of the plasma, adiabatic invariants have to be conserved uh, unless there are small scale fluctuations which would break this invariance. Um, so the meaningful invariants to talk about are this uh, perpendicular pressure divided by density and B. And the other is what's called the parallel invariant, uh, which involves uh, parallel pressure B squared and then Q. Uh, the first one is particularly easy to understand. Magnetic moments of the particles have to be roughly conserved. If you average it over the distribution function, you get conservation of this quantity. Uh, so if you have a patch of a plasma, for example, and locally increase the B field, it would drive uh, perpendicular temp temperature up, uh, parallel temperature down, and you would get a strongly an um, anisotropic uh, pressure tensor would the per perpendicular temperature would become larger. This is known to be unstable to what's called the mirror instability. So this would uh, in enhance uh, small scale Larmor, Larmor size fluctuations. It would bunch magnetic fields into a collection of mirrors which would start scattering the particles and sort of restore the, um, try to restore the isotropy of the plasma. And there is a similar instability. If you decrease the B field, the parallel temperature get enhanced. This is unstable to what we call a fire hose. So why should you care why this can be important on larger scales is because this self-regulates the pressure tensor of the plasma and this pressure tensor of the plasma can be dynamically important as it uh, feedbacks on the momentum equation in the plasma. So ideal MHD ignores this effect. It assumes that the pressure of the plasma is scalar. Although in this environment, especially if the plasma beta gets low, the anisotropies can be potentially very large. Uh, another effect that is neglected is are the heat fluxes. So the uh, flow of heat along the field lines is not restricted uh, unless it's also limited by anisotropies. Um, and this could have important uh, effects on dynamical evolution. And uh, third effect is that uh, reconnection happens differently in collisionless plasma and in ideal MHD. In ideal MHD or resistive MHD or um, some sort of uh, numerical resistivity type scheme, uh, the electric field is produced by uniform resistivity everywhere. In collisionless plasma, this is the Ohm's law that you see um, in the bottom uh, right corner, electric field comes from uh, anisotropic pressure of electrons localized at the X point. So you could think of it as a resistivity being localized to very small regions uh, on kinetic scales and current sheets. And this enhances, uh, it, it is known to enhance reconnection rate. So if you take a collisionless plasma simulation, this would reconnect roughly 10 times faster than the, um, uh, than the MHD simulation. So this is not captured by global MHD simulations. So in order to test some of those effects or at least uh, understand their importance, uh, we are pursuing a program to um, model this with uh, uh, particle and cell simulations and general relativity. Uh, to remind you what these codes are doing is that they have a grid of electromagnetic fields and an ensemble of the particles and these particles are pushed through the grid and collect the self-consistent currents that feedback on the electromagnetic field. So this is the, the loop that the code solves every time step. So I'm gonna show you two examples which relate to this uh, story uh, of uh, formation of large scale current sheets. So this is a isolated experiment uh, which we conducted in a different context but has a lot of relation to this flaring process. So here the simulation started with the dipolar magnetic field sitting on a black hole which then opens up and creates a large scale current sheet. And this current sheet leads uh, 
to escape of the magnetic flux from the black hole. So you could think of it as an isolated flaring moment in this magnetically arrested simulations where you form a large scale current sheet and the field in the jet reconnects through it and escapes from the black hole. Um, so the upper panel is the peak simulation. The bottom panel is the MHD simulation. You see that they're grossly similar in, in the sense that both current sheets uh, sort of fragment themselves into a sequence of plasmoids and the uh, magnetic flux is advected to the, um, to the current sheet uh, through this, um, uh, to, to the current sheet. Uh, as you see in the bottom right plot, this is evolution of the magnetic flux on the event horizon. You see that the rates are different. So the rate of escape of magnetic flux from the black hole in a collisionless simulation is factor of five larger than what our resist resistive MHD simulation predicted. Uh, so this dynamical difference uh, could be very important um, in understanding flares and the basically reconnection is just controlled by the uh, plasma physics, uh, not by sort of numerical scheme here. Uh, and then I, um, I, I briefly want to describe a second experiment which uh, resembles a magnetically arrested flow, although it starts with much simpler initial conditions. So here, what we start from is a uh, sort of a ball of spherically, symm uh, spherically symmetric plasma with a uniform magnetic field. Uh, so this has been uh, known for, uh, for a year now from uh, papers by Sean Ressler that uh, when people simulate it in MHD, it sort of resembles the arrested state on a long time scales. So on the left panel, you see the initial state when the magnetic flux just gets advected towards the black hole, it accumulates and, and, and uh, up to the time when it becomes dynamically important, the uh, accretion gets arrested and the disk basically gets expelled and you form this current sheet uh, sitting right on the event horizon. Um, so uh, this is the, the third panel. Uh, you, you should look at the equatorial plane, you see a current sheet. Um, if you look closer into those flows, you see that there are a lot of small scale fluctuations in those flows. So the uh, right panel uh, delta B over B shows the fluctuation component of the magnetic field. And you see two different types of fluctuations in the uh, polar flow and in the equatorial plane. Uh, so the uh, flow in the polar plane becomes unstable to mirror instability because as you advect more magnetic flux, the local magnetic field increases in the polar region. And that means the uh, perpendicular temperature also goes up. This means that it becomes highly anisotropic and tries to isotropize itself. So the, you excite mirror instability and you see this delta B over B fluctuations. And this is confirmed by the plot of the temperature anisotropy on the right. You see there are two di different regions um, which are uh, uh, sustaining this uh, mirror and fire hose instability. So they, uh, uh, the pressure tensor of the plasma becomes highly anisotropic and uh, this drives instability. This is a lesson. Um, so how the isotropization happens is shown by this um, uh, histogram. So the uh, two plots basically show uh, the distribution, the histogram of grid points having the uh, given uh, ratio of perpendicular and parallel temperature and plasma beta. You see that uh, in the beginning, the, uh, uh, this halo of, of, of yellow points wants to overshoot across the upper line, uh, which means that the uh, perpendicular temperature gets highly enhanced. But the uh, next plot, which is the same simulation, but plotted later, shows that the anisotropy gets limited. Uh, and this uh, um, uh, red lines are basically the thresholds for mirror and fire hose instabilities. This is, this is the plots very similar to what people study in the solar wind, uh, where they find that the um, fluctuations in the plasma limit themselves to respect this uh, mirror and fire hose boundaries. And our uh, peak simulation shows it more or less from first principles. Uh, and the right plot shows uh, the evolution of the magnetic flux on the black hole. You see it rising as the flux gets advected towards the black hole, then it saturates more or less in the med limit, and then it drops because of the re reconnection that is induced in this current sheet. Um, so you see that the uh, blue and the orange line, which are the peak and the MHT, they saturate more or less the same values, which means that it's, although this pressure and isotropies are there, they're not so important. Uh, in terms of uh, global dynamics. The, more, the saturation rate of the mat state is more or less the same. However, the rate of reconnection at which the field uh, gets expelled from the black hole is very different again, as uh, I showed also in the building experiment. Um, so to conclude, I just want to, uh, to say briefly how this will go further. We want to expand the setup. We want to create not a uniform field, but more a turbulent field, which would be more resemblant of 3D systems. Uh, we want to look at the particle acceleration, both on this flaring sheet and the jet's boundary, where 
the um, lots of turbulence and the reconnection should, should happen. And uh, lastly, we want to look at the effects of this uh, anisotropy uh, uh, of the electron pressure tensor on the uh, observables and uh, still look for effects on the global dynamics. Uh, thanks. All right, thank you. That was perfect. Great, right on time too. Um, so I think I see one question, or one, one hand's been raised for a while. Uh, Mohammed, did you want to ask? Yeah, um, Sasha. Hey, Mohammed. Uh, I have a question about the, this comparison between the resistive MHT simulations and the GRPEC simulations. Mm -hmm. So the resistive MHT, you basically assume that the mass of the electron of the negative charge over the proton is, L is zero. But for your GRPEC, this is electron positrons, right? Um, so I mean, so um, is, is in MHT, in MHT, uh, in MHT, you don't have an, a mass of electron, right? So the meaningful question, I guess, is uh, to compare the Ohm's laws. Uh, so yeah, in MHT, you don't get the terms which are proportional to the mass of the electron or exactly. pr proportional to the uh, pressure tensor. Uh, the simulation is electron positron, so that's true, but. Uh, from local studies of reconnection, we know that electron ion plasma would reconnect also at 10% uh, of the alpha speed instead of the 1% uh, of the alpha speed. So I think you know that this should hold. Um, you tried electron, uh, electron proton. Some we did not try it in the building experiment, but this know. spherical accretion simulation that I just showed you, this has a uh, mass ratio of five. So the mass of the ion to mass of the electron is five. I see, I see. Thank you. Right. I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, uh, Koshik, do you want to? And uh, Britt, could you get your slides prepared? Hi, Koshik. Hi, hi Tasha. Uh, a quick question. So, uh, in the uh, equation list, I saw GRR peak. So, uh, I was wondering whether you, uh, you did any simulations with radiation and whether that changed the reconnection rate. Uh, not yet in this context, uh, we did uh, radiative reconnection simulations in context of uh, pulsars. Um, in that case, we never saw any enhancement of the rate, although this has been predicted theoretically. I think the truth is that the reconnection rate is more or less set by the particles which are not radiatively cooled. So radiatively cooled particles are at the tail of the distribution function. They don't really contribute to the um, rate of reconnection by to the pressure electron pressure tender at the X point. Um, so I, I think that for black hole conditions that will be true as well. I don't think radiation gonna uh, affect the rate. It would enhance the uh, like a transient onset. You would collapse the sheets faster, but then they would sort of heat up and bounce, and the steady state would be more or less the same. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you again, Sasha. Um, and remember, Thanks. you can ask more questions in the Slack. So uh, next we have uh, Britt Jeter, who's uh, at Waterloo. Um, Britt, do you want to share your screen? Perfect. All right. Yeah, can um, you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, you can, I think I can see your screen too. All right, does this work? Can yeah, everybody that works see things? perfect. All right, you can take it away. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Britt Jeter. I um, recently was at the University of Waterloo as a postdoc and will soon be a postdoc at the Academia Sinica, um, probably in a couple of weeks now. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about non-imaging signatures of variable jets using the NGHT and specifically one of the reference arrays. So why do we wanna study jet variability? Well, the short answer is jets are variable. Um, is most jets we see are variable in many different timescales. M87 in particular is variable uh, on timescales of days uh, to months to even years. Um, of course, there's this very famous movie from Lee Walker Jr. from almost, uh, you know, not quite 10 years ago that shows uh, lots of variability in the, in the large scale jet in M87. And even in the 2017 EHT observations, there was uh, clear evidence for variability at the horizon scale over the course of a few days. Um, other jet sources like 3C279 also exhibit significant amounts of variability. Here is uh, a grid of uh, co uh, components that were fit to uh, component model fits uh, to 3C279, uh, where the slopes of these lines represent changes over time. 
uh, for a lot of different components related to uh, 3C279. So it's very clear that uh, a lot most jet sources are going to be variable and on time scales that we can probe with the NGEHD. So I have a model for jet variability that I've talked about uh, before. Some of you may know a little bit about this. Um, I start with a static force-free background jet uh, semi-analytic model that's based off of the Broderick and Loeb 2009 uh, system, where I inject uh, a series of control points that determine a non-thermal electron density. These control points uh, uh, are essentially fixed to their own unique streamline. And as they evolve in time, they shear away from each other. And this produces a, uh, a variable emission profile. And this uh, Im image morphology and uh, light curve behavior can change uh, very strongly depending on where you start your initial electron distribution um, and depends most strongly on the spot radial launch position. So you can see here for uh, sort of a large movie spanning about you know half a milliarc second, a spot launched uh, very close to the horizon will shear out and extend up along the jet uh, in different ways, depending on whether or not the spot is launched inside the jet versus outside the jet. Um, that's all well and good. Image reconstruction is a very important part of uh, EHT science, but the actual direct data that the EHT will collect will be complex visibilities. Um, important science will uh, be done without imaging and just by uh, looking directly at the visibility data. Um, and uh, sort of important visibility products are the visibility amplitudes uh, and the closure phases. Um, and so you, see, you can see here from the first set of EHT results, uh, the sort of gross visibility amplitude uh, results of all the observations um, where they all sort of uh, have this very significant null at about three giga lambda, and then this extra bump at about six giga lambda. The closure phases, some of them uh, are relatively constant over time, but some of them do exhibit significant differences uh, day to day. Uh, which is an important thing that we can try to get a handle on for the future. Of course, this is a conference about the next generation EHT. And so the great advantage of, of the future will be the massively improved coverage, which will very much help with the dynamic range. This is critical for studying jet physics because uh, you know factors of a thousand dynamic range will let us really study and connect the low surface brightness jet features to the very bright compact horizon. Um, and this will let us study where and how these jets are launched. Uh, by adding all these extra stations to the NGHT, this will give us uh, dramatically more amounts of closure data. Um, with 19 NGHT sites, you'll get about 153 independent closure phases. Um, this is compared to the about 28 closure phases that we get with the current EHT. So there's a wealth, a, a huge wealth of more data here, uh, especially independent uh, uh, data products. Uh, there are a small set of sort of families of closure phases that are represented here. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the next coming slides. Um, but again, this all this extra coverage gives us so much more uh, information to look at. And so there's sort of three types of non-trivial closure phases that we can look at. There are, um, you can sort of think of them using a swing set analogy where you have uh, rising closure phases, you have wrapping closure phases, and then something a little bit more interesting, which are breaking closure phases. So you can think of the rising closure phases as, you know, sitting on a swing set and swing back and forth, you know, just maybe by a few tens of degrees. A wrapping closure phase if, is if you use the swing set and go all the way around and come back to your starting point. And a break is maybe a little bit, uh, you know, hard to wrap our heads around. That's sort of like the, the legs of the swing itself snapping and rearranging itself in the middle of your swing. Um, and this happens when the nulls interact with the stations associated with the closure phase triangles um, and lead to very uh, interesting phenomena. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about these breaks here. Here's a movie. Um, just to explain what you're seeing here in color, or each track is essentially what the closure phase would look like over the course of one night of observation. 
And then each different color represents the next day in a series of daily observations. So this is an, uh, what it, if, for example, we looked at M87 for 20 days, each night we get an, a new closure phase observation on the same triangle, in this case, LMT, SMA, uh, SMT. And this is kind of what the evolution would look like if this shearing spot was captured during this observa uh, observation period. And so what can happen is you get uh, this sort of break and collapse and then another break. And the indication that a null is interacting with this situation is these very high thermal error bars, um, which is sort of a sort of smoking gun that you've got something interesting happening. Uh, the other, of course, very important data product is visibility amplitudes. And with extended coverage, you essentially fill in all the gaps in your UV plane. And uh, now we can start studying the differences in directional behavior between east-south, for example, or, or north-south and east-west baselines. Uh, we can track features in quadrants of the UV plane as opposed to just sort of uh, doing our best guess. Uh, and you know, compare with the current EHT visibility amplitude coverage for M87, you have large gaps at uh, short baselines, maybe a gap in the intermediate baselines um, and at long baselines. But with the NGHT, you'll fill in all this coverage. Um, and here you can see sort of the evolution of the visibility amplitudes for one of these shearing spot scenarios uh, traveling up the jet. You know, it's a very energetic event um, that maybe could happen like. Uh, once or twice a year. Um, but if we can capture one of these, we could get sort of a, a very great wealth of science. And here you can also see importantly that uh, the null locations will evolve in time. And it's important to be able to track those. So here's sort of an example of that as a spot sort of uh, starts dimming and the uh, quiescent structure uh, returns into focus. You can see that, uh, you know, sort of seven days after the initial uh, launch of the energetic event, you this visibility amplitude starts coming back down. You get a couple of special baselines that uh, see the nulls come back first. These are sort of uh, important haystack uh, uh, baselines, uh, haystack to Chile, sort of direct north-south um, at about six giga lambda. But the next day, uh, you get a completely different set of uh, null behavior, where now uh, you have sort of east-west baseline CA null um, at about five giga lambda, whereas at six giga lambda, um, there is of course very important null information, but the sort of uh, predictor baselines that we observed beforehand, the, the haystack baselines at six giga lambda are now sort of normal. You know, the null has passed beyond them. And so we can sort of look at what exactly is happening by constructing visibility maps of the total visibility. Uh, we can do this because of course, this is a simulation. So we have perfect knowledge essentially. And here we can see a movie of what's happening here where uh, we have uh, log visibility in, in color where the contours represent uh, factors of two uh, invisibility. And in gray, you can see the uh, locations of all the uh, stations in the UV plane. So I'll let this play again. And you can see the spot gets brighter, dominates, but then the quiescent structure comes back. And as it does, these nulls sort of uh, come back relatively rapidly and settle back down to uh, the quiescent stage. And so you get uh, relatively complex uh, behaviors. And so again, you know, part way to settling back down, you can see that this null, this north-south null approaches you know, these haystack baselines, and then we'll move the next day within, you know, a few M uh, sort of away from that location. And we should be able to track that if we have nightly observations. Um, and of course, this structure, this null structure at, at uh, long baselines then moves into a, a different place where you can detect it, sort of 90 degrees offset from the initial null location. And eventually after approximately 10 days, we settle back down to uh, the quiescent uh, structure. So being able to track these variability, uh, uh, this variability in the visibility space will help us map out uh, the full structure and will help uh, 
help us uh, reconstruct what exactly is happening uh, inside the jet. Um, so again, the NGHT is going to be vital for studying this type of physics. The coverage will let us track ejection features, both in the image plane and in the visibility plane. Um, like I said, we can track the null location over time as they evolve because, you know, uh, if a flare pops off or something, um, and of course, investigate the directional UV behavior. Um, we will absolutely want to be able to observe multiple times a year. Um, you know, monthly would be great if we could observe uh, for uh, a week straight, uh, once every month, I think we could uh, do a lot of really great science. We could maybe capture uh, one of these energetic events. Um, and of course, having partial arrays be able to observe uh, is very critical for this because uh, we may only be able to get the full NGEHT array maybe once or twice a year. Um, and like I said, uh, energetic events will require daily observations, even for M87. Uh, M87 is kind of at the larger end of our mass range, which means it has a relatively slow time scale. You know, uh, the gravitational time scale is about nine hours. But uh, if you have turbulent energetic events, uh, the system could be variable, especially in the visibility domain, uh, at much faster time scales than that. Um, and even in the 2017 array, we noticed that there is significant evolution night to night. Um, and of course, other jet sources that are lower mass will evolve much more rapidly. And so we need to be able to leverage uh, much more rapid observations with uh, potentially a smaller subset array. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Uh, we're a little over. So um, if there are any questions, you could, uh, I think we can move them to the, the Slack. Um, so uh, next up, we have uh, Antonio. Antonio, do you want to bring up your slides? Yes, they are coming. Okay, can you see? Yeah, I can. I can see your screen. Um, all right, take it away when you're ready. Yes. So I will discuss about magnetic reconnection in 3D accretion flows around black holes, and I will discuss about flaring activity. Now, my focus will be specifically for Sagittarius A star. That's why in the third slide I will stress similarities and differences from a MAD configuration that is usually used to explain M87, Sagittarius A star, and all the black hole jet systems with what uh, is a multi-loop same simulation. Now the outline, a bit of motivation, even if it is not needed here, then I will discuss these differences between MAD and multi-loop same. I will go to our 2D GRMHD simulations and how we have put radiation to have some first uh, uh, results that we can set against observations and then to our latest 3D GRMSD simulations. Now, as we are expecting the upcoming Sagittarius A star PhD results, I want to show here a light curve from ALMA at 230 gigahertz. As we can see, the, the flux is rather stable with not so much variability. And this is what we see at the center of our galaxy. However, Sagittarius A star flares every some hours. On the bottom left, we can see a near infrared light curve at 2.2 microns. And you can see that every some hours, uh, some flares are coming. Now, on top uh, right, we can see that at the time of a bright flare, circular motion was detect detected close to the event horizon. Two important things in analyzing this circular motion, this uh, observable from gravity, was that poloidal B field is needed in order to explain polarization. And the best fit orbiting hotspot was shown to have a super Keplerian motion. So I will keep this and I will continue with this slide. So I want to stress out that the MAD simulation, and you can see in this column here, suppresses the MRI due to the strong magnetic flux close to the horizon, always has a jet, okay? that has a huge and steady uh, outflow. So we expect to see somehow this power. And again, I say that these are mostly discussing the concept and uh, focusing on Sagittarius A star. So with going back to the literature and check all 43 and 86 gigahertz images from MAD simulations, we always see an extended jet base. So if there is something like this, we should observe this in Sagittarius A star. 
And for polarization, most probably it can be reduced. It is reduced, it is ex expected to be reduced due to the tangled magnetic field. Now, in the case of a multiple chain, assuming here I say that diffusion is dominant, some thousands are, are G far from the hole, but there can be other cases to build a multi loop chain, but I will not say more on this. So, this is not a match simulation. You will never beat a match simulation. MRI is active, you never have a steady jet. And the outflow is determined. So at some point you, you produce some outflowing features, and then again you are back to quiescence. Now, if you check these images in 43 and 86 gigahertz, the, the structure of the image is non-extended when you are non-flaring. So this is a straight observ observable for Sagittarius A star, if we see something at the jet base or not. And maybe if we uh, uh, have observations at the same time with a flare, maybe we can see some extended features. And I will not say more in this talk, but we expect significant polarization fraction. Now, what I call multiple saying, and the simulations are in the literature from the beginning of, I mean, more than 10 years now, but this is the initial condition that I put on the left. So loops of different polarity. And during the evolution, this come to the black hole, and you can see from the difference in the color, one polarity comes to the black hole and the second polarity is near it coming. So this builds, as the GRMHD evolves, huge currency between these two uh, regions all the time. When they come closer in the low density region above and below the black hole, this is where reconnection is more powerful and energizes more the plasma. And this is where we expect more uh, features to be uh, observable features. So a case of, uh, of uh, this specific one, here we are around uh, 5 to 10 RG above the black hole, and you can see in the first panel is the, the Z component of the magnetic field, and a current seat is clearly seen here. In the middle panel, you can see, of course, that the current is speaking here, and it is clearly producing a, a plasmoid chain and uh, moving to the third line, you see that all these features have gained uh, a lot of energy compared to the surrounding plasma. Now, if we want to see how this uh, will show up, we keep these features that get energized by plasma. This is a project led by, by a PhD student from the University of Athens, Dimitropoulos Ioannis. So he's putting radiation to this simulation, and what we see in the near infrared this is a light cap from the simulation, is that every now and then we can we, we see bright flares. And bright flares, this is a limit from observational, uh, from the observational lit literature for near infrared flares for Sagittarius A star. Every now and then there are flares that just are close to the limit. And of course, there is intense variability, even further in the light cap at times, that you are below the threshold of a flare. In order to put radiation, we use recipes from peak simulation. And then from our GRMSD simulation, we use the local uh, plasma quantities like plasma beta magnetization, etc., in order uh, to see how efficient this space particle acceleration locally and the power law of non-thermal particles. Now, what's even more interesting for us is that calculating some frequencies close to the K band, we can compute the spectral index. And these are, uh, can be straight compared to, to observation. So everything from this red line and on the right is a bright flare. So this is a bright flare here. And these are uh, intermediate states. Actually, they are uh, at the middle of the flare. And these are these can be compared with observations from Bremer et al, for example. Now I will continue to the 3D GRMSD simulation. And before going to this, to stress some uh, details, first of all, this is the resolution that we have used. We initialize again with a multi-loop B-field configuration, as I showed before. In all the plots that I saw, I saw uh, the density on the equator plane alone, but I need to stress out that plasma is everywhere. So here is the disk. and. On the left is density, on the right is magnetization. So the plasma is everywhere from the disk close to the going to the low density funnel above. So here, as I said before, I plot density only in the equatorial plane and I plot the field lines. 
with different colors are field lines that have a, a different sign in the vertical magnetic field component on the event horizon. So these field lines, when they come closer together, they will reconnect. And you see that a ne you never reach a state that you have a funnel of the same polarity, but these field lines are tangled together and are always at all times uh, ready to reconnect. But even sticking to one uh, field line of the same color, like this Kian one here, you see that uh, in several points, you can have X points, which again, you can have uh, reconnection and particle acceleration. So here, what I will show is from all these events that I just described in the 3D plot with the field lines, here I plot only uh, plasma that gets energized through magnetic reconnection. And let me go to the movie. So as these field lines come above the event horizon in 5 to 10 RG and, uh, and reconnect, they give energy to the plasma. What we observe is that every 5 to 10 M, these things happen. Some of them can go back to the black hole and be accreted, as you can see here close to the event horizon. Some other can fly away. However, every, every some hundreds of M to 300 M to 500 M, from 300 M to 500 M, there are some structures that are compact and stay like this for a longer time and they reach uh, 30 RG far from the black hole. And here you can see at least on the top uh, uh, above the equatorial plane, these distinctive uh, features that look like plasmoids uh, in 3D. And this keep their shape for some time. And this can be really important for uh, Sagittarius A star observables. Now picking only the plasmoids in the region that I show you, we, we try to see the, uh, the uh, important parameters. So on top, I show the azimuthal velocity. And as you can see at some point, after they birth, they gain super Keplerian azimuthal velocity. So this can be really important for explaining some observables, we believe. And that's it for my talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And keeping it on time. Um, so I, I see uh, I see one question in the uh, in the chat. Uh, sorry if I, I butchered the pronunciation. Uh, Paramvir, um, yeah. do you want to ask your question? Oh, you're pretty. You're pretty um, faint. Do you can you? Uh, is it better now? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. So, a quick question, uh, and first of all, thanks for the talk. And so in the case of uh, Matt, and in the case of Sane, when you have like really high reconnection, uh, would there be any uh, effects on the initial opening angle of the jet? So first of all, in my case, this multiple saying we never have a jet is formed. So uh, okay. for the mud, for the mud simulation, I, I didn't get exactly. You are asking about the opening angle with respect to what? The half opening angle. Uh... With respect to initial spin, with respect to initial torus, with respect to initial magnetic field. So different spins can have different angles. But, okay. Yeah. Okay, this I have to think so. Uh, but uh, the, I'm asking about the, particularly this uh, half opening angle, which is inversely related to the Lorentz vector. And I don't. Uh, so my assumption is that if you have uh, strong magnetic fields, you might accelerate the particles differently, and that would show some effect. So this opening angle that you discuss, maybe is more relevant for GRB physics and not close to the horizon. Imagine an outflow, I mean, of a high Lorentz factor and you can see. Okay. And uh, one divided by gamma. I don't know if this is what you are saying. Yeah. But I think okay. it's a different topic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. So an excellent discussion. And uh, if there's any other things you want to talk about, you can please ask them in the Slack. So. Uh, uh, next up, we have um, Bart Ripperda. Uh, Bart, you want to share your screen? Yes, thank you. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen properly and hear me? Yep, 
it sounds good. You, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I want to tell you a little bit, uh, although probably all of you know already, about flares from M87. Um, we have seen them uh, in, in three separate occasions now, uh, and, and one was announced on Telegram in 2021 as well. Um, and uh, on one of those occasions, uh, a concurrent radio flux from the nucleus was, uh, was observed, which tells us that the TEV emission uh, can come from uh, near the horizon. The variability time of these flares is uh, of the order of a few days, which tells us that the emission region is of the order of a Schwarzschild radius, and just by causality. And um, the question I'm trying to answer is, uh, can these flares be powered by magnetic reconnection at the horizon? Because we know from uh, solar physics, for example, that reconnection can accelerate particles and power uh, flares through a magnetic uh, mechanism, let's say. Um, similarly, from Sagittarius A-star, as you've heard already from Antonios, uh, we've seen flares uh, over the past 25 years and gravity uh, caught like an, uh, even a flaring hotspot uh, flares occur like about once per day, and um, they are typically non-thermal in the near infrared or in X-ray. And also here, the idea is that reconnection can um, can take place at the horizon. It can form plasmoids, and those plasmoids, uh, as we know from local simulations, are filled with accelerated and radiate uh, radiating uh, electrons. Also here. Um, there is a huge separation of scales. The elect electron dry radius is about 10 to the minus 11 Schwarzschild radii, whereas the hotspot emission region is about one Schwarzschild radius. Um, so that, that's very hard to probe numerically, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how we, we aim to do that. Um, recently, there was a very exciting uh, upcoming collaboration announced between the EHT and the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, where we can actually potentially see an EHT image uh, while we're also observing a near-infrared um, a flare, which could, could tell us a lot about the physics that's, uh, that's going on. So um, if we assume that, uh, that, that an accretion flow is, is mad, uh, actually, um, how can a current sheet form? Like this is a, a cartoon by Ashley Bransgrove of how a magnetically arrested disk brings in magnetic flux here, while the RAM pressure is, is larger than the magnetic pressure. At some point, there will be so much magnetic flux that you get into the arrested state and there, uh, there is a current sheet, the disk is, is, is uh, held up, the accretion is arrested. And we simulated um, this current sheet here with a simplified uh, setup in GRPIC and GRMHD, which shows us that it's magnetic reconnection that then at that point actually um, expels the flux uh, uh, from the horizon. Um, you need a lot of resolution to resolve this. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later uh, how much exactly. And um, the idea from, uh, from these like 2D simulations uh, is in particular that uh, th this um, mechanism can only occur in MAD at the horizon um, because first of all, it happens episodically. Uh, and second, um, uh, you need a very strong jet to power uh, uh, um, uh, the, the reconnection giving you a strong flare. Um, and additionally, the, the sorry, reconnection rate here particularly governs the flare duration um, so as Sasha Filipov showed with GRPIC, you, you potentially get a faster uh, rate. Those are the takeaways from our 2D simulations. Um, here you see uh, how such a reconnection layer forms and how it, how it creates these uh, plasmoids that I mentioned before. Now, the question is, does that happen in the 3D MAD simulation? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, here you see video um, and you see uh, here that the magnetic flux at some point drops. Um, so this is, this is like a, a mad episode. Uh, and, and at this point, um, indicated by this red dot, also the mass accretion rate drops. And, and, and that's shown here by the fact that the accretion disk is, is ejected over a large part of the azimuthal angle. So there is just like a current sheet left here. And that, that actually means that if there is a, a TV flare powered here, that it can escape uh, potentially because, uh, because the disk is, is further out and less, there are less seed photons. So if we zoom in, we actually see that, um, that this looks a lot like the, the, the toy problem that I showed before. There is a plasma and stable current sheet, current sheet at the horizon. Um, and there is a sort of a non-axisymmetric magnetized magnetosphere that separates the horizon from the disk. Um, this state is transient, as I showed. Um, it's, it's it, 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 it powers an episodic flaring state. And the reconnection here um, powers these, these plasmoids that can sort of pile up into a larger hotspot that could potentially explain the gravity observations. Um, what's very interesting is that the EHT or the NGEHT might observe M87 in a flaring state uh, once every few uh, years. So it would give us sort of an unobscured 
image of what, what goes on at the horizon when the disk is, uh, is further out. Um, resolving all of this in simulations requires uh, sim uh, resolutions of, of larger than, uh, say, 1,000 cubed. Uh, we, we went up to 5,000 by 2,500 by 2,500 cells which is the largest uh, GRMHG simulation ever done uh, to date. Um, and it was a thousand times larger than each EHD simulation. So, so you cannot build a library. You have to understand the physics uh, just from a single or a few uh, simulations. Um, this was really only possible with the GPU acceleration from uh, Hammer uh, as developed by Matthew Leska. I'll show you what this looks like in 3D. Um, here you have the typical quiescent state in the left bottom corner. And blue and green field lines are both uh, in the accretion disk. They're both accreting. Um, and you see that the temperature, which is dimensionless here, it's P over rho, is everywhere below one. So none of these structures are hot. And then you go to the upper image, which is a flaring state. And now you see that the blue field lines, which are seeded at the same points as here before, they're all in the disk, but they're further out. And only a few of them are accreting over the small part of the azimuthal angle. Well, the green field lines here are in this spiral current sheet, which is at temperatures uh, far above one. Um, and if you look closely, if you zoom in, you see here that there are little plasmoids. So those are wiggly helical field structures. And, and you literally see reconnection occurring. Uh, so here, uh, originally horizontal field reconnected and it forms a loop that falls in and it forms a, a sort of a, a vertical part of a loop that is moving out and it will be stretched out while it moves out further. Um, what's important to mention is that it's really zero guide field reconnection. Uh, so if you take a, a cut in a locally flat frame here, you will see that there is no guide field and that all components of the B field are, are reconnecting. Um, so this current sheet heats up the plasma. And what's interesting is that it sucks in plasma from the jet and reconnection is known to heat plasma to temperatures proportional to the magnetization in the jet. And the magnetization here is that at the sigma floor. So the temperatures here in the current sheet or at the sigma floor. So if the sigma floor is 100, the temperature here in terms of P over rho is also 100. And the same goes for the jet sheath, which is heated uh, up to very high distances uh, through this reconnection process, through the exhaust of the reconnection process. Um, in this 3D simulation, a flare takes about 100 or a few hundred RG over C, and it happens, it occurs every, say, 1,500 to 2,000 RG over C, meaning that globally, the time scales for Sagittarius a star are, are matching. We see one or two flares per day that last for 30 to 60 minutes. And again, for EHT, uh, for MD7, this means we might observe a flaring state uh, once per few years for a few, uh, for a few days. But to really understand the heating, the, the, the composition and the temperature of the plasma here, we really need particle and cell simulations that, that can uh, probe the electron temperature in particular. Um, so now, of course, an interesting question is, can we actually model the hotspot that's observed by gravity? And I show you the same actually video, but now I show you the temperature here, the reconnection layer formed. And here you see that the hot stuff, the hot matter um, is expelled from the reconnection layer. And now it looks as if the inner NRG went back to your quiescent uh, accretion um, state. There is no current sheet anymore. But here you see the, the, um, the field that is expelled from the reconnection layer and originally horizontal field here is transformed to this large vertical field, which is now completely stretched out into a large flux tube. Um, and if you look in the meridional plane here from the top view, you see that this flux tube consists of hot plasma. Um, and because non-thermal, uh, because pair plasma from the jet is accelerated in this current sheet, it becomes non-thermal and it's ejected in this hotspot. This hotspot will actually be a low density flux tube consisting of non-thermal electrons and positrons that are being mixed into the electron ion disk through these instabilities, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities that you see at the boundaries. So this is also particularly interesting for EHT because uh, this can give you a non-thermal uh, paraplasma component in your electron ion um, disk. Um, yeah, that was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, you have time for one quick uh, one quick question. Um, I, I still see a pair of beer. Is that a residual hand from before? All right, I'm gonna guess that is. So um, if, if there's any other questions, uh, you can ask them in the Slack. And um, thank you again, Bart, for that great talk. So thank I think you. finally we have uh, Razi. You wanna share your screen? Sean, absolutely. Do you see that? 
Yeah, I see it. All right, shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the works that I have been doing with my great collaborators here, and it's about the completion, and it's about the linking the polarized image of the synchrotron emission with the magnetic field structure. So let's just jump in and actually see what we are going to talk about today. So as you may know, and of course, a lot of you actually already know, synchrotron radiation from a hot plasma that is orbiting around the supermassive black hole creates some polarized images. This is very common to expand this polarization in terms of beta M coefficient that was formerly done with Palombo et al. in 2020, and that has been used extensively in paper eight of EHT actually collaboration. So that has something to do with the expansion of the linear polarization in terms of beta M coefficient, when it turns out that beta two is the dominant source of the emission and actually the basically linear polarization. You could also go further and also compute the EVPAs, electric vector polarization angles that are the half of the phase of the linear polarization. So this is actually very important because the image polarization is actually a mixture of many different key effects such as the magnetic field uh, morphology or actually geometry, the velocity of the fluid that is orbiting around the, actually around the spinning black hole, the spin of the black hole itself, power transport, a strong lensing, and many other effects that are potentially very actually interesting to be figured out, but uh, practically are very complicated to be understood numerically. And that's exactly when semi-analytical models can help us actually out significantly. So here I'm going to compute the beta 2, as I said, as a dominated source of the polarized emission. And I'm going to use it, actually use some general machine simulations to compute that and later on use some of the insights that we have gained over the time from this general machine simulation and the way to ray trace them and put them in some of the semi-analytical models that we're actually doing by uh, Noron et al in some official papers by the ESG collaboration and also Geras in 2021. So let's start with the GRMSG simulation. So as I said, uh, from the GRMSG simulation side, you can just compute the linear polarization. Here we have used the actual library of the simulations from Illinois cluster, and we use the IPO ray tracing code to compute the intensity and the linear polarization. You can also go further and compute, for example, a secular polarization across the time for math versus the same simulation. And this also actually with greens, basically the actually arrows uh, are the EVPs of the linear polarization. So as you see, this is a completely possible to compute them and it's actually very complicated to know where does the emission come from and how you could potentially understand, you know, what's going on near to the supermassive black hole. So in more detail, you can actually go and compute the amplitude of the beta 2 and also the phase of the beta 2 for different emission models, including different R highs and R lows and so on and so forth, with and without the Faraday rotation and so on. So that actually gives us a rather complete package numerically to understand what is the actually the amplitude of the beta 2 um, you know across the time and also the phase of the beta 2 but i see this is very complicated process and it's very very complicated to understand what's going on and that's exactly the way that we have to switch to semi-analytical model so as i already described noron et al and Gareth et al in 2021 came up with a very excellent understanding of where does the emission come from or some actually understanding of the polarized image using some kind of like emission that are coming from the equatorial source around the supermassive black hole. So that's very interesting because that would actually describe the geometrical effect of the black hole spin on photon geodesics and isolate them from other rather complicated actually combinations of the relativistic, gravitational, and also electromagnetic process near to the actually emission region. And it actually provides us some insight into the accretion flow and a spatial geometry after, you know, that would actually affect your polarized image. And more importantly, this model includes some arbitrary observer inclination, black hole spin, local boost, and also local magnetic field configuration. So why this is so important? Because that's exactly the junction between the semi-analytical works and also the GRMSG simulation. 
because as I already told you from the geometry simulation, you can actually trace all the um, all the way down basically the motion of the hot plasma, but this is rather complicated to get a lot out of it. But then if you are able to actually nail this down to some particular quantities that will be described in a moment, you can use them and you can just put them in terms of actually this arbitrariness in terms of the observer inclination, for example, switch it to MAD7, black hole spin, velocity field, and magnetic field. And really try to understand what you can actually get out of the emission region near to the black hole, and also whether or not this ring model that was proposed by these actually folks before they may or may not work for different simulation type. So let me start with actually what I'm uh, trying to talk about here. So here is actually some emission maps from uh, entirely from geometry simulation in which we have actually started from the ring model or some actually, you know, whatever image in the image plane. And we just say parallel transport them back in the Trinity. Where does the emission come from near to the supermassive black hole? We actually as we mutually average all of them and we see them uh, across the time. And afterward, you can actually go further down and you can average them over the time. And this is where, where actually the top 30% of the emission is come from. So in another word, imagine that you have 3D space near to the black hole. You can actually, you have a lot of orbiting actually hot plasma near to the black hole. There are some variabilities and so on and so forth. There are some azimuthal actually dependencies. You can average them all the way and you can ask yourself, what is the top 30% of the emission? So that's exactly where you actually have some parameters in, in, you know, in terms of the rings for mad versus the same. And you can actually insert these quantities back inside the semi-analytical model. So it includes where does the emission come from? And you can actually generalize this across different geometry simulation of mad versus the same at different r highs, for example, and different black hole spin. So quite remarkably, you see that the rings is actually there not like a really not like a rings, for example, because that's just like the top 30% of the emission. Who knows what would happen for actually lower or higher uh, fractions of the emission? But it's actually remarkable because in some cases, for example, MAD, you can actually say that at least for top 30% of the emission, you are really limited on actually a very bright region around the massive black hole that could be interpreted as a ring. When you go to the same, as I will describe in a moment, things becomes much more complicated, especially sometimes there are some branch of the positive or negative. And sometimes there are actually some effects like the further rotation that may affect you. So from now on, I'm gonna to actually use this shaded, uh, basically a uh, white region, and I'm gonna to insert those parameters inside the ring model and just try to understand, for example, the magnetic field or the velocity field as the required for your actually semi-analytical prescription. And then literally try to understand what you can actually get in terms of the EVPAs and in terms of the actually, you know, both from the geometry simulation and from the ring model, and just try to compare them. So here is actually a comparison. On the top, you see the geometry simulation, while in the bottom, you see the ring model. So it's, uh, by, by actually quickly looking at them, they actually seem to be not that much different from each other. And I'm going to quantify them further on as we proceed. You can proceed further and you can also actually consider the same. In this case, you see that there are some kind of like differences, for example, especially for actually saying of positive spins, like for example, you know, either 0.5 prograde or 0.94 prograde, you see that there are some changes actually. But for mass, they are really actually interestingly very much matched together. How much I can further actually basically quantify them. So here is the phase of the beta two and also the fraction or change between the ring model and the GRMS simulation for both the MAD and same for different black hole spin. When you actually see that when you put the GRMS simulation for that top 30% of the emission actually inside the ring model, they are remarkably close to each other. Well, when you consider the same model, you can actually see that, especially for prograde motion, there are some differences actually. And sometimes in order to actually get where exactly the emission come from, I also had to actually consider the fraction or change of all of them, you know, across different, basically, across different locations that are just a slightly actually, you know, displaced from the median of the top 30% of the emission. And just literally figure out which one is closer. 
So as it turns out for the math, it actually works remarkably well, but for the progress, sometimes I had to slightly change it from the average case in which the retrograde and zero spin were well described by that actually, you know, notion that I just described, but for the same of the progress, for the progress same of the 0.5 and 0.94, you had to slightly change where does the exactly emission come from. And even that, if you actually put them inside of actually, you know, inside of some kind of like a fractional change, you still see that they are not that much actually close. So it goes all the way to, for example, 75 percentage of the fractional change between the GRMSG simulation and between the ring model. And, you know, for this part, but then when you actually slightly change it, it's a hundred percent change, you actually go to 25% or whatever, less than that, about a 15% uh, change uh, that you can actually see. So in summary, it seems that for math simulations, there is a very remarkably good actually agreement between the predictions of the semi-analytical work from ring model and also the GRMSG simulation, while for same models, you actually see that retrograde motions are much better prescription while the progress are not. So let me actually go to the end of the slide in which I'm actually, I just, uh, just, I just summarized what I already told you. And I do also have a little actually proposal for why sign of the prograde won't actually work. So here is actually the phase of the beta two for math versus the same across different black hole spin. When you see that with and without the Faraday rotation, the curves are very remarkably close to each other. However, when you go to the same, especially for actually uh, for the case of the basically prograde motion, they are completely different when you actually see that the V done without further rotation. And it's actually even more when you consider the basically median of the beta two across all the snapshots for same versus the mat in which you can actually see that for the prograde motion with and without further rotation, things are remarkably different. So that actually brings us to the conclusion that maybe further rotation is messing up the actually the phase of the beta two and then the disagreement that we actually, we already described for the same of the prograde, but this is remarkably actually analog to the further rotation case for the mat simulation. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Razi. Um, sure. I, I, that was a great talk. Um, I think we've gone over a little bit, but uh, Sorry. so yeah. everyone's, no, no, no. This is, this is my, my, is a, I, I should have been stricter, but um, so thank you again. Is there, everyone's allowed to go back and enjoy the 10 minutes of the break. And then I think there's the, um, Astro uh, 2020 review session after. So, but, uh, and again, if you want to ask any other questions, feel free to put them in the Slack channel. All right. Thank you, everyone, for all these great talks. Enjoy the thank rest of so the Thank you so much, everybody. Conference.